Well, today we've come to the end, the end of the Apostles' Creed, which we've been looking at for the past few months. And the section we're talking about at the end of the Apostles' Creed talks about what happens after we die. So what I want to do today is read the whole Apostles' Creed as we come to this culmination of this time we've been spending in it. The Apostles' Creed, if you haven't seen any of the other sermons, you can go back and check them out here on YouTube. But briefly, to summarize it, the Apostles' Creed is a confession or a statement of what all Christians believe. And it's designed to be pretty short, not super detailed, but these are the things that Christians believe. This document goes back 1,700 years, and it's something that many people say often. And the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. These last two lines about the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting are what we're going to look at today. As we've seen, the first three quarters of the Apostles' Creed is about God. It's about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God, what we believe about God. And the last quarter of the Apostles' Creed is about what we believe about humanity, what we believe about all of us together, which is the church, the communion of saints, And then we look at some things that highlight our individuality, the resurrection of the body. Every person has one body, so our individual nature is highlighted here. This section also connects back with the section about Jesus, because in the Jesus section, we talk about how we believe that Jesus was raised, and he also will come again to judge the living and the dead. And so this section that we're looking at today, this end part, talks about our resurrection and our eternal destiny. So we're going to talk a lot today about resurrection. And the big idea with resurrection that I think is so important for us to revisit over and over is that the Judeo-Christian idea of resurrection is quite different from the normal Western way of thinking about life after death. I say this often, but I don't think we can say it enough because our culture, when we think about life after death in our culture, we tend to think about the idea we have bodies full of suffering, we have pain in our lives. One day when we die, we get to go be spirits living with God in some kind of spiritual existence where we can escape the pain of the world. But the big idea in Judeo-Christian resurrection is that the body is raised and not only raised to Uh, come back as it was, but to be glorified or transformed. One way of saying this is that resurrection is not really about life after death. Resurrection is about life after life after death. So in the Bible, in the New Testament especially, we see a picture where we do die and our spirits are present with God. That's life after death. But the main emphasis is on what happens after that, when God restores our bodies and our spirits, brings them together together, and heals us, transforms us. And this is such a strange idea because it's so much more comfortable for us to fit in with our normal Western cultural way of thinking about life after death, that we, our spirits will somehow transcend the pains of the physical world. But that's not what the Bible talks about. Resurrection means the renewal of our bodies in the age to come. So the Jewish people through most of the Old Testament, didn't have much of a concept of the afterlife. And then in the book of Ezekiel, God gave the prophet Ezekiel a vision where a valley of dry bones, which represented the nation of Israel, is raised to life, and then the breath of God comes upon them, and they become fleshed out with new skin, and and God's spirit is upon them, and that represents the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. And over the the last, there's a few other small references to the idea of resurrection in the end of the Old Testament. 
And then in the ensuing years leading up to the time of Jesus, the Jewish people began to understand that God had promised them that one day he would restore the whole world. God wants to not only restore human bodies, but all of the, the creation, the whole world, the whole universe. He wants to heal, transform, and glorify it, the whole physical universe. So the big idea of Jesus is that this future restoration has come through into the present. This has already taken place. And the most important chapter in the Bible that talks about the resurrection of Jesus and our resurrection is 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to look just at the last part of it today in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? So, the Apostle Paul is writing about the idea of resurrection, and he's explaining to these people who live in the city of Corinth how important the idea of resurrection is to following Jesus. At one point in this chapter, he says, without the resurrection of Jesus and of us, our faith is useless. He says that not everyone will die, but everyone will be changed. And this is a big idea in resurrection. Resurrection is not just the restoration of what was back into what it once was once again, resurrection is about transformation or glorification. When Jesus went up on the mountain of transfiguration and was clothed in glory and the, the disciples saw him glowing like a star, that word is the word metamorpho that we get the word metamorphosis from. And that's the idea here that we will all be transformed into something that we can't even imagine, just like the caterpillar can't even imagine the butterfly. There's something we can't even imagine that will happen with our bodies, something that is far beyond how we are now. And whoever is alive at the time of this, they will not sleep, they will not die, but they will be changed. At the end of the age, at the end of the present age, the age of suffering and sickness and death, when our world is the mess that we see, God will heal all things. And if you are in Christ, God will heal you as well. If you have trusted in Jesus, if you have given your life to Jesus, if you believe that he is raised from the dead, then this is promised to you as well. He will heal your body. He will heal you wholly. So this unique way of understanding life after death that is unique to the Bible is that our bodies matter. The physical things matter. It's not just your mind that goes on forever or your spirit or your emotions, your whole self will be restored and beyond restored, transformed. What's interesting when we see Jesus's body is we get a picture of what will happen to everything else. The Bible calls this the first fruits. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. He shows what the whole thing will look like. My garden is starting to get fruit in it. Some of my tomatoes are starting to grow. And if I had forgotten which kinds of tomatoes were which, I would be able to pick the first fruits and tell what kind of tomatoes were growing on each plant. In the same way, Jesus's resurrection shows us what the resurrection will be like for all of us. Jesus's body still had its scars. It was the same body. It had markers of his life and of his brutal, violent death on the cross. It was also still his distinct, unique body. He didn't just become abstractly human when he was resurrected. He was still Jesus, the son of Mary, the one from Nazareth. He was not just a human, but this human before he died. And after he was raised, he was still that human. You, in the same way, will still be the same person that you are forever. The body you have will be transformed, which is a break from how you are right now. But the body you have will still be your body forever. God will heal your body perfectly and transform it. What that means is we are meant to be embodied, fully integrated persons. 
you are not just meant to live in your mind or live in your emotions or live in your passions, but your body matters. And the emphasis in modern psychology and in mindfulness thinking, the emphasis on connecting our body with our our inner self is a hugely important idea that is all throughout the Bible and validated by the idea of the resurrection. In Deuteronomy 6.5, the law includes this famous phrase, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Sometimes we can try to parse out what are these things? What is the heart? What is the soul? And what is the strength? And if we do that, we actually find out that the heart was where the Hebrew people thought your thinking was done. So what they called heart was is more like what we would call mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. The soul isn't just about the inner self. The soul is your life. It's the same word as life, the same word as being or self. And in some ways, that's closer to what we would call the heart, the, the, uh, the seat of emotion and who we are with deep within. But the soul isn't just an inner thing for Hebrew people. It's the whole, whole person. And then finally, love the Lord your God with all your strength. And that involves our physical selves. So the point here is that all of who we are ought to be expressing love to God and living in love of God. We are meant to be integrated people where our heart, soul, mind, strength, our whole self is united and made whole. And God promises that what he wants to do is heal our whole selves. In the end of 1 Thessalonians, Paul is saying goodbye to the people he's writing to and he blesses them like this. He says, may God himself, the God of peace, peace is shalom, wholeness, the God who brings us, makes us whole again. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, wash you, cleanse you, set you apart. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this life, what God wants to do is set us apart, not just in our minds, not just in our actions, but even our bodies. God wants to set us apart as dedicated to him. He wants to clean us. He wants to purify us, make us his place of dwelling, his instrument of how he acts and works in the world. So may God himself, the God of wholeness, sanctify you through and through, holy. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this isn't just about escaping the limits of embodiment. We believe in the restoration of our bodies, and that means the whole self will be healed. We'll be healed from our relational problems we have with other people. We'll be healed from our physical uh, challenges that we have. We'll be healed from our mental and emotional uh, problems that we have, the, the challenges we face. God wants to heal us completely, and God will heal us completely when we are resurrected. So the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Now, when you hear the phrase life everlasting, you can think, okay, we're going to go on forever. And in a sense, that's all there is to say about it. When we hear the phrase everlasting life, we immediately jump to the idea of eternity as being outside of time. And that is a good way to think about it. But there are other ways to think about it as well that are significant. In the Old Testament, they didn't have a concept of eternity being outside of time. They didn't think of God as existing outside of time. They thought more of the idea of endless time. So when we read Psalm 23, uh, it says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever doesn't mean like when you die, you go to heaven and you're outside of time. Forever means for a really, really long time, the longest time you can imagine. So One way of thinking about eternal life is to think about life that goes on forever with God. And that's different from thinking about it being outside of time. Even in the New Testament, the word that's usually translated as eternal or everlasting has a slightly different meaning. 
In Matthew 25, there's the famous passage where Jesus says, whatever you have done to the least of these, you have done unto me. And he calls the people who have blessed the least of these, who've taken care of them, he calls them righteous. And then he says, whatever you did not do to the least of these, you have not done for me. So the people who didn't care for the poor, didn't uh, take care of the foreigner and the stranger, Jesus says, you didn't do that for me. And he calls these people wicked. And so he separates them to his right and his left. And at the end of this parable, the end of this picture that Jesus gives, he says this, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now, what's interesting, this is one example of many in the New Testament, but what's interesting about this word eternal is that it's not quite as straightforward as we often think that it is. The word eternal in Greek is the word ionios. It can also be translated everlasting in some English translations, ionios. And you see this first part of the word ionios is ion, and that means age. We sometimes talk about eons of time, and that comes from this Greek word, ages, long amounts of time. So in the Jewish way and early Christian way of thinking, we live in the present age, the age of suffering, sickness, and death. But God is coming in the future to bring a new age, the new creation, the age to come. These are all different ways of speaking about it. And when this age comes, it will be the age of shalom, wholeness, harmony, and peace. What eternal life is really talking about is the life that belongs to the age, the life of the age. That's talking about the life of the age to come. So Jesus says that the wicked will go away to the punishment of the age and the righteous will go to the life of the age. These things are kind of mysterious. They're not clearly defined. And I think it's good that they're mysterious. We have some idea of what life after death is like from the Bible, but we have a whole lot more questions than we have answers. Who are we to think that we could fully understand these things? The promise of everlasting or eternal life is really the promise that we get to take part in God's coming age, the new creation. When heaven and earth are brought into shalom, into wholeness and harmony. When we believe in that and we believe in the promise of bodily resurrection, that's where we find hope. The idea that God wants to restore us wholly and invite us to participate in this coming age of peace, the new creation, that's our source of hope. We're facing questions, you and I. All of us face challenges in our lives, unknowns and things that we're afraid of. You face anxiety, I face anxiety. But the promise we have is that things are going to get better. God has a future for you and me. He isn't going to abandon you. He isn't going to abandon this world. He isn't going to abandon your body. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. God is setting you apart, body, mind, and spirit. God is bringing you into an integrated whole with him today. And he promises that he will fulfill this in a way that goes beyond your wildest expectations. He's going to transform us to be like Jesus. So hold on to hope and remember that God has a future for you.